Julie, you want to take it away? Go for it. Hello. Am I on? All right, excellent. Okay, so we are gonna talk about sleep and particularly how sleep affects cognition. So I'll let you know I'm a neuropsychologist, that's my area of expertise, which means I look at the brain and how it's associated with your cognitive abilities, particularly when things go wrong with the brain or when things go wrong with your cognitive abilities, because I'm a clinical neuropsychologist. So I study cognition and lots of things that affect your cognitive skills, only one of which is sleep. So I'm not a sleep expert per se, but I have done some research on sleep, how it affects cognition, and I thought, you know, this is probably a good topic for you guys because I have the feeling that there's probably a fair amount of sleep difficulties going on in this room and the associated daytime sleepiness, given what we know from the research literature. So let's jump right into it. We spent about a third of our lives asleep, and this is for very good reason. You actually probably are depriving yourself of a very important health variable if you're not sleeping enough, because sleep supports every physiological system of your body. Sleep is absolutely crucial to your immune system, absolutely crucial to your metabolic system, your endocrine system, your thermal regulatory system, and your cardiovascular system. And notice I don't even have the brain up there yet. It's absolutely crucial to your brain. But that's what we're going to focus most of our attention on today. And while sleep does change as we age, the vast, vast majority of research shows that our sleep need does not change. If you are an adult in this room, whether you are 18 all the way up into your 90s, you need about seven or eight hours of sleep a night on a regular basis. That does not change. Okay, I've already seen the grins like, yeah, right, that's never gonna happen. Well, we'll take a sleep quiz in just a minute and we'll just see how bad your sleep really is. But for adults, generally seven to eight hours, with some individual differences, there are a few people that are short sleepers out there, uh, way less of them than they think because they're usually napping during the day. Um, but we do see a couple of differences and since we have a mixed age audience, um, young adults, this will not surprise you. The fancy word for it is delayed sleep phase shift. So those of you who managed to make it through high school um, or who, who parented kids who suddenly hit high school around the age of puberty, all of a sudden they can't get up in the morning at all and then they're wide awake into the wee hours of the night and that's called a de delayed sleep phase shift. Um, but you still need eight hours of sleep. That's really hard to do when school starts at 7.30 in the morning. Um, now, the opposite happens as you get older, you actually have an advanced sleep phase shift. So as you get older, you become tired earlier and earlier in the evening. Oh my goodness, look at the nods at this table up here. Um, we all know what that's like. And then we get up really ridiculously early. Um, and so these shifts of when we're sleeping happen and change over age, but the vast majority of evidence shows, regardless of age, you need seven to eight hours of sleep. Um, it's, it's, the studies actually show that it's, it's related to longevity. It's related to living if you don't sleep this amount. You live longer and more healthfully if you sleep on average this amount. So I could just stop there and you'd all go away really depressed, right? Um, but let's go ahead and take that sleep quiz. So if you want to kind of see how you're doing on, on, you can do this mentally, or if you want to write it down, you certainly can. I'm going to ask you these questions. These are the kinds of questions that come from uh, sleep clinicians and sleep questionnaires that ask people how they're doing in their sleep. So some of it's subjective, but I want you to kind of think about your answers to these, and then I'll give you the, you know, what should be the right answers if you have good sleep. Um, the first part of the sleep quiz is focused on nighttime behaviors. Part two will come on the next slide, and that's daytime consequences. So nighttime behaviors. How many hours are you spending in your bed? So in order to answer that, you need to think, when do I lay down in my bed? And when do I get up out of my bed? And how many hours that is? And then the second part of that then is how many hours of that time in bed are you actually spending asleep? So think that through for yourself. You obviously know how much you should be sleeping now. I already gave away the right answer to that one, but be honest with yourself mentally. Again, not expecting you to turn these in. I'm not gonna score them for you. Question two, how long does it usually take you to fall asleep on average? Now I've said on average, and I already know from working with a lot of undergraduates that what the heck is average? Because it's very different 
on the weekends than it might be on the weeknights. Um, uh, and that's already a problem right there that we'll talk about. But on average, if you lay down in your bed, how long does it take to fall asleep? Is it minutes? Half an hour? Is it hours that you lay there before you fall asleep? Um, and again, the second part of that shows you that 30 minutes is kind of a cutoff that clinicians and researchers use. How often do you have trouble sleeping because you can't fall asleep within half an hour of laying down? Is that something that doesn't occur that often or is that something that really is very frequent for you, that you're laying there that long? Question three, how often do you wake up in the middle of the night or early morning and you can't get back to sleep? And so this isn't, I have to get up to go to the bathroom and then I, you know, go right back to sleep. This is you wake up for whatever reason, it might be pain, might be you're shifting, might you hear a noise, your bed partner snores, you need to go to the bathroom, and then you cannot get back to sleep. Or you wake up earlier than you intend and you just can't get back to sleep and you lay there. Again, if that's rarely, that's one thing, but if this is something that's happening frequently, think about that in your sleep quiz. How often do you have trouble with breathing, snoring, coughing in your sleep, problems with respiration? This is one you might not know, but your bed partner or your room partner might know a lot more because they're the ones that are usually disrupted by this. They're the ones noticing the snorting and the gasping and the, and the snoring and the noises that you make. But for some people, they're very aware of that. So again, we all do this sometimes. We do it more likely when we're in the old, what I call lazy boy recliner position. So flat on your back, that's when most people have this. But for other people, they do this a lot. And, and, and that would be a bad sleep sign. And then how often do you take medication? Something prescribed, something over the counter, or even something like alcohol in order to try to help you fall asleep or maintain your sleep. So is this something you're doing on a regular basis or is it something once in a while you have to take something to fall asleep? So, I'll just ask you generically, and you certainly don't have to raise your hands if you want. How many of you have a sense that one of these is problematic for you, based on what I said? At least one of these items. How about more than one of these items? So a fair number of you in the room, and again, that would not be surprising given what we know from research about disturbed sleep. We already know you should be sleeping about seven or eight hours. I'm gonna guess that's the one that most of us aren't doing, based on research evidence. In terms of sleep efficiency, which is time of sleep relative to time in bed, it should be about 85%. 85% of your time in bed should be spent asleep. And that's how a sleep clinician or a researcher would, would determine the answer to number one. In terms of falling asleep, obviously the magic number is 30 minutes. So if very frequently it's taking you longer than that, sometimes this surprises people because I have people come sometimes for a clinical evaluations who will say, I, I have terrible problems falling asleep, and they think they should fall asleep the minute their head fits the pillow, and uh, hits the pillow. And I, I want to say, really? Because that would be wonderful if that would happen. It, it can take up to half an hour to fall asleep, and that would still be normal. But if you're frequently having difficulties falling asleep past that time window, we would call that a sleep initiation problem. You're having trouble initiating sleep. In terms of question three, then, waking up in the middle of the night or waking up too early, that's referred to by sleep clinicians as a sleep maintenance problem. You get to sleep, but you can't maintain sleep, and you really need to maintain sleep, solid seven or eight hours without uh, too much of an interruption. Again, breathing, snoring, coughing, this one is relevant to one specific kind of sleep disorder, um, obstructive sleep apnea. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as we go up, along. But people have lots of sleep problems that aren't related to this alone. So I don't wanna focus only on that. And then taking medication, especially if you take it chronically, it's not recommended that you actually use medications chronically. In fact, they can add to sleep problems. So if you're having to take something on a regular basis and you're chronically using it to fall asleep, it's a good idea to check in with your healthcare provider about that because that's problematic. Yeah. Is there another item that, that makes sense on this list, which would be uh, spending what feel like, feels like significant periods of time sort of asleep, but you recognize it's a really crappy sleep? You're not wide awake, but you're definitely not either. Um, that's, yep, I'll repeat the question. So the question seems to be that, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, ask, do you mean that you wake up and you realize, gee, that I think I've slept for seven hours, but that sure was a crappy night of sleep? Well, or a period of time where 
So you wake up and you're like, I'm not feeling refreshed. This isn't good sleep. Yep. Um, I'm going to answer it on part two of the quiz because usually people ask that when you wake up the next morning um, kind of issue. So, and there are, the longer sleep questionnaires have a lot more questions. I focused on the ones that research suggests are the variables most associated with cognition in this particular quiz. And if there are other questions, please ask at any time. Yeah. You mentioned a constant uh, amount of time for sleep. Right. What happens to those of us who fall asleep at the television? Yeah. <laughs> uh, wake up at midnight and go to sleep for another six hours? We'll, we'll talk about that. It's called fragmented sleep. And, and uh, it's not a good idea. <laughs> Short answer, but we'll talk about, about that because that is very common. Students do that too. Students will say, I'm going to lay down in the middle of the afternoon for a nap, and it's three hours later, and then you get up for dinner, and then you can't possibly fall asleep. It's, 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 it's not the same as a good solid amount of sleep. Yeah, question. So, like, um, I've taken medication. I'm going to have caffeine. <laughs> Yeah, so the question has to do with medications, and there are lots of medications that affect the way we sleep. They affect because they're stimulating or they're sedating and our metabolism doesn't actually uh, metabolize them fast enough, so then the sedating effect lasts into the daytime when you really wanted it to be at night. So medications definitely interfere with sleep, and some that you wouldn't necessarily expect to. So there are several high blood pressure medications, for example, um, that, that are really common for older people to take, and they mess with the sleep cycle. And I'm going to show you the sleep cycle in a minute so that you can kind of see what that looks like. And you wouldn't expect that to be a side effect. They're not sedating, but they actually do mess with your, the, the, the sleep cycle that you should experience, and thus you don't feel like you got a good night's sleep when you wake up the next morning. Part two of the sleep quiz, and a very important part, because it doesn't matter so much to us, although it's frustrating to wake up in the middle of the night and feel like you're not very rested, what really matters is how it affects you during the day, right? Because that's when you need to be functional. And so the second part of sleep quizzes and sleep surveys that clinicians will do is, what effect does it have you, on you during the day? So do you typically wake feeling refreshed? So um, I will say prior to this semester that uh, my whole family hated me because I did. I get, up at, I get up at 5 a.m. every day. I snap awake, often five minutes before my alarm goes off. I'm ready to go. That's, that was just my nature. Now I'm having the worst semester of my life. I'm not getting sleep. And I now understand the rest of my family, with apologies to those who know my daughters, um, who wake up groggy and are never refreshed and grumpy and you can't speak to them or expect them to remember anything for quite a few hours prior, prior to uh, or after they wake up. But typically awaking feeling refreshed means you got a good night's sleep. So if that's not happening, you clearly have some kind of sleep debt. Question two, do you typically awake with a headache? The combination of not feeling refreshed, awakening with a headache, and knowing that you gasp and snore or snort or someone's told you that are, are kind of, uh, again, the symptom set that goes with uh, sleep apnea, which is, again, a very specific kind of sleep problem. We're going to talk about it because it has cognitive effects. But most of what I'm going to talk about today is outside of that realm. It's, Bad sleep affects your cognition, even if you don't have apnea. Um, but typically, awaking with a headache outside of imbibing in substances that you shouldn't be imbibing in, that's, that's usually apnea. How often do you have trouble staying awake while you're doing an activity? So you're doing something that should keep you awake, like driving, um, actually uh, eating. People will fall asleep eating sometimes. Um, engaging in social activity, having conversations with others, and you'll fall asleep. And for some reason, you guys are laughing because you must have done this kind of thing. Um, versus how often have you actually fallen asleep doing something passive? Like in your class, you fall asleep. You're sitting there, you're listening to the professor, and their voice is going like this. And you're trying desperately to stay awake. And we can see you, by the way. <laughs> And I've been there. I've been on the other side where I am fighting. I'm like, oh, this poor speaker, because I know what it looks like um, when you see the people who are, are drifting off. So if this is happening frequently to you, particularly while you're trying to do an activity, that's very problematic. 
a little more common to do it when it's something passive like watching TV or listening to a lecture. But that's still very problematic. You shouldn't have such a sleep need that you're falling asleep at the drop of a hat. In fact, sleep researchers will put you into a lab, quiet room, dim lights, see how long it takes you to fall asleep um, as a way to test it, a sleep latency test. But if it's while you're doing cognitive activity, that's problematic. So these, so again, don't have to raise your hand, but just think it through or mentally raise your hand. How often do you feel like that, that you, you have this often enough that this would be problematic? You're aware that sleepiness, I'm going to raise my hand because this semester it's definitely true. That's why I have a cup of coffee, which is the dumbest thing for me to do at 5 o'clock <laughs> in the world. I can tell you that right now. I'm going to pay for this later. But I had to stay awake because, heaven forbid, I fall asleep while talking to you all. <laughs> oh, that would be bad. All right. So what do we know about this? We know that sleep disturbance, oh, question, yeah. That's, that's a question for your health care provider. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly true that you, know, you could be feeling poorly and sleep can be very restorative. But there could be a lot of other reasons there. I, again, there's lots of reasons people have headaches, and I wouldn't want to be your physician based on that. So, but there, you know, sleep, a, a mid-afternoon nap we'll find is very restorative, especially for your cognitive abilities. Um, yeah. Yes. There is such a thing. Question has to do with too much or too little sleep. And there are individual differences. So there are individual differences in the amount of sleep um, need that people have. There are some short sleepers out there. I think we all envy them. Wouldn't it be great if you really only needed four hours of sleep a night? I think how much you would get done. But the vast majority of people need the seven to eight. And there are some people who need way more than that. That's also pretty rare. So there's some individual difference. And you may find that, yeah, you're just kind of over relaxing. All right. So, but we do know sleep disturbances and sleep deprivation are very common. And it's partly our society, right? So back in the days before electricity, we lived by the sun. And so when the sun was up, we were awake, we were aroused, our circadian rhythms matched with the sun. This is when our body was awake and our metabolism was happening. And then the sun went down and, and our body was signaled to relax and rest and recuperate and go to sleep. But now we have lights everywhere. We, we can have daylight inside and outside. Outdoor recreation is available 24 hours a day because there are fields with lights all over them. And so not only that, but activities are available 24-7 now. Um, some of you can remember with me the days when there were like three TV channels, and at midnight, uh, they went to snow. There was nothing to do. We, had to, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have 24-hour cable. Really, it was a signal, OK, go to bed. There's really nothing else to do. Um, and now there's activities 24-7. Um, people who work extended shifts or midnight shift jobs, and there are a lot of those, are, are violating that normal circadian rhythm of day and night in terms of their jobs. And as this poor gentleman is experiencing, one of the things we, and I say we because now I've started doing that too, we think, oh, I'll lay in bed and I'll do something really passive and, and relaxing. I'll get on, on my phone. We have so many portable devices that are easy to hold up, or my Kindle, I'll read a book. And it turns out that the blue electric light is in a spectrum that sends light signals to your brain that mimic sunlight and tell you, oh, I should be awake now. They're actually sending those signals back to your brain and releasing melatonin in a way that then tells you, oh, I should be awake, instead of really being relaxing. So that's why I call it the blue light electric sc electronic screens of insomnia. You're sending light signals to your brain directly in front of your eyeballs. No wonder you cannot fall asleep. Plus, you might not be doing very relaxing things if you're reading Reddit. I, I used a cool word there. I have no idea what that means, actually. Um, uh, 
I understand it makes people mad a lot, though. And so if you're, if you're looking at things that are you know, raising your arousal and attention and, and getting you mad or you know, reading political statements, you know, you're, you're, that's not particularly relaxing. But really the problem is you're sending blue light signaling daylight right directly to your brain, basically, when you do that. Question in the back. <laughs> Yeah, so the question has to do with shift work. And it's very hard for shift workers to adapt to working in the night and sleeping during the day. They tend to have more difficulties with the kinds of cognitive tasks we're talking about, tend to be vulnerable to more errors, tend to be at higher risk for dangerous errors depending on the job. So even if they try to use you know, blackouts at home and, and noise reduction, we were meant to be daylight creatures. We're not nocturnal creatures. So it's really hard to fight that. And then often the shift work shifts, which is a whole other problem. Yeah. What about for people who uh, live in Alaska, where there's daylight for like so long, and then it doesn't Very difficult when you are having massive different exposures to constant light all the time and constant dark. And they, they, they try to control for that the best they can. So they have environments so that they can make it. This is like the nighttime now. But it's really hard when the sun is constantly there. So good question. Luckily, most of us don't have to encounter that. So how do we actually know that sleep affects cognition? Well, we've done a lot of research. And there are various research methods by which we can study this. I'm going to focus on the human ones. But there's also a lot of research that, that uses rodents to look at not only changes to the brain, but also changes to cognition. We're actually pretty good with using mice models of memory, for example, and reaction time to be able to see. And with mice, we have a little more control. I mean, if you can picture keeping mice up all night or giving them less sleep all night, it's a little more controlled than it is for humans, right? But we have various methods of studying it. Some studies use a design called continuous extended wake episodes. You students are doing that all the time. Instead of saying, I'm cramming for a test, you can say, I'm experiencing a continuous extended wake episode. <laughs> um, uh, it still means you should be going to bed. But, um, but we can keep people up all night past the time that they're accumulating that sleep debt and continuously test them. And usually those designs use uh, measures of attention and vigilance. So you're going to repeat throughout the night some kind of computer vigilance task. And then you get past your bedtime further and further, and you're repeating that task. And what we see are a lot of increased errors the further you get out from when you should have been asleep. So that's one design that gets used a lot, kind of an acute sleep loss. A more chronic design, but a lot harder to do with humans, would be to get people to sleep less for many nights in a row. Of course, then you have to really have control over them, right? Because you need to make sure they're not napping during the day to make up for it. But they might hold your sleep to, you only get four hours. You're sleeping in our lab. We're going to wake you up so you really only get four hours over a week. And then we'll see how you do with that slightly less sleep. It's a harder design, a lot less studies on humans that do that. Long-term total sleep deprivation, these kinds of studies are common in the military. So they've actually done this with a lot of, um, in a lot of, is anyone here in the Navy or familiar with how Navy SEALs are trained at all? Has anybody heard of Hell Week? Yeah, so my, my nephew tried out for the Navy SEALs, and not only are the horrible, challenging tasks that they put them through already heinous enough, but during Hell Week, you have to do them all without any sleep, day after day after day, no sleep. And so they do that for a week. Um, and so he made it to week, or uh, day four, and some very interesting things happen to you at that point because sleep starts to intrude on your wake. And so it, it, it's a really hard week for people to get through. Um, Long-term total sleep deprivation. Um, and doesn't really explain what you all are experiencing with your slightly chronically underslept um, performance. And then the most common way in humans is actually to get ratings of sleep quality. So much like the quiz that I gave you at the beginning, you can ask people, what do you think about your sleep? We can try to confirm that um, by hooking people up with an actigraph, for example. And these are so common nowadays with Fitbit. Um, keeping, keeping in mind that just because you're not moving doesn't mean you're not sleep, that you're sleeping well. Um, but, but we can kind of get people to do sleep diaries and check with an actigraph. Are they really not moving the time that they say that they're asleep? Um, we can bring people into a sleep lab to try to confirm if they're really sleeping not too much. 
Although I will point out that for many people who have insomnia, an actual diagnosable insomnia, they sleep like babies in the sleep lab, but they can't sleep well at home. Kind of like when you take your car to the shop and it runs fine, but you know, it doesn't at home. Um, but there's a good reason for that. So we'll prob I'll, I'll be able to come to that toward the end if, if we don't run out of time. So that's a very common way to look at it, is people's reports of their sleep. So when we put all those different research methods together, they kind of tell the same story. And that is, probably not too surprising to you because you have your own personal experience here, sleep affects your cognition. What parts of your cognition, what part of your thinking are most affected by poor sleep? I mentioned it before, attention and vigilance. But it's actually kind of interesting, the effect that it has. So, we do lots of tasks that are remote, that require us to pay attention, maybe not really cognitively demanding, but you know, you're checking something and you're looking for errors, or you're doing some, some simple math, or you're looking for a certain symbol to show up in some data coding if you're, if you're a computer scientist type person. It's not super high challenging, but you're kind of doing this low level sustained attention task. That's more likely to be affected, and you're more likely to make errors the longer that task is and the longer you stick to it without a break than a task that really requires you to be challenging in your attention. That's less affected by your sleep because you're kind of able to override it a little bit. You got a little more arousal and anxiety and motivation attached to it. But generally, attention and vigilance definitely affected. People make a lot of errors when they're sleep deprived, and they're not aware of them. Reaction time definitely affected. We are slower in our response to any stimuli when we are sleep deprived. And this one's hard to correct. It turns out some of the restorative things we do, reaction time is the most resistant to getting fixed by the kinds of things that can fix sleep. We still remain slower. Another domain that's really important is executive function. And we could spend, I'll come, I'll come to you in a second. We could spend hours talking about what executive function is. I'll try to keep it simple. It's, it's kind of your most higher order cognitive skill, putting together all your other cognitive skills. It's the area that knows, here's my goal. This is what I need to, my cognitive resources to pull together to get to the goal, get the feedback on the goal, correct it if I need to. It's kind of like the executive sitting behind the chair. That's why they call it executive function. And the big parts of executive function affected by sleep are your working memory. So this isn't just your attention, but you have to pay attention, shift your attention, but hold this in your attention while you give your attention here, shift back and forth in those attention to do many tasks. And keep in mind the end goal while you're doing it. And the other very important part of executive function is your break system or your inhibition system. So we all are thinking things or hearing things or, or seeing things or experiencing things, and we know we probably shouldn't do them right at that moment. So, you know, oh, I shouldn't swear right now. I, my, my inhibition system would tell me don't swear. Um, or I'm, I'm not gonna react to the fact that I smell chocolate and I'm gonna eat all those M&Ms. Um, that's our inhibition system. Well, it turns out that another big effect of poor sleep is poor inhibition. Your brakes get turned off a little, so you get disinhibited and impulsive much more easily without that good working executive system. And then memory. Um, memory is interesting because there's memory effects that are related to executive function. We're less efficient and organized, and, and, and therefore we don't organize our memory well to remember things. But there are certain sleep stages that appear absolutely necessary for you to learn new information. So basically all your brain is doing all the time is neurons firing, and when they fire together, they wire together. And when they fire together and wire together, that's how you learn new information. And if you don't hit the right sleep stages, your brain can't fire together, wire together accurately. And so you will not encode that information and you will not consolidate that information and you will not remember it later. Keep that in mind, students, <laughs> when you're cramming all night long. You're not giving your brain cells a chance to fire together, wire together if you don't sleep. So, big effects on memory. Question that was on these stages, or cognitive abilities. Oh yes, I will talk about that later. I will talk about that later. So she was talking about during the day, eventually you stop functioning, and that's true for all of us. But 
is definitely more affected by sleep deprivation. So what's interesting about the sleep effects on cognition literature is way too much or way too little, both, both of those are correlated with cognitive problems. But way too much is rare, and it's associated with a lot of medical and psychiatric disorders, typically. So way too much sleep is, is something that's unusual, and we're not going to talk about it because the vast majority of you probably are getting way too little sleep. So we're going to focus our energies there and what we talk about. And then, again, I'm going to mention obstructive sleep apnea only very briefly because if you think you have that and, and, you, and you've got symptoms of it, you really need to see your health care provider. It's very treatable, but it's very dangerous to, to remain untreated. What's happening in obstructive sleep apnea is, again, while you're asleep, you probably know your muscles relax, they actually become paralyzed, and that means that any sort of extra tissuey type things that might be in your throat, if you have a big neck, if you have big tonsils, that's all relaxing too. And air is supposed to flow down, you know, from your mouth down to your lungs. And if that just kind of all falls flaccid and blocks it, air can't flow. And it takes a little while for the brain to realize danger, danger, not enough oxygen, and make you gasp and snort and move to, to get that air flow back. And so they can measure that in a sleep lab. I'll show you a picture in just a second of someone hooked up to do that. If that happens repeatedly during the night, your body and your brain are experiencing hypoxia, lack of oxygen to the brain. And that's very dangerous for your heart, and it's really bad for your brain. Your brain uses a lot more of the oxygen than the rest of your body relative to its size. It's metabolically really active. And so it's, it's definitely a contributor to cognitive impairment, but even taking that off the table, poor sleep affects your cognition in all these ways I just talked about. So here's the picture I was telling you about. So this gentleman is hooked up, ready to, he's actually in an apnea lab. So he's hooked up, ready to have his sleep measured all night. And then we're going to look at what his brain waves should look like if he's a good sleeper. So he's got hookups up here that are going to measure his brain waves. He's got hookups by his eyes because this is going to measure the rapid eye movements that are part of sleep. And then we'll talk a little bit more about, he actually has oxygen hooked up to him as well. He's got um, an electrode here to look at muscle relaxation. Sometimes they'll also help those on other body parts. And he has a pulse oximeter measuring oxygen flow. Like, is that stopping at some point? And then they can puff air in to say, okay, does that clear it up? Does that, does that help, help him move it? He's laying in a super horrible position for apnea. This is this is the apnea position. <laughs> this is when we're going to snore and gasp most often, but yet it's the position we find so comfortable most of the time. So let's see what his brain waves would look like. This is kind of what your uh, the different kinds of waves that would appear during sleep. I'm going to try to cruise these cruise these cruise through these kind of fast, but up above at the very top are asynchronous waves that are associated with being awake but relaxed. So right when you lay down in your bed, this is what your brain waves would generally look like when they're measuring them. You're, awa you're relaxed, you're awake, we see what are known as alpha waves. As you start to get sleepy, you're going to enter stage one sleep. This is when what we see clinically is when people are fighting the sleep. So if you've ever watched people and their eyes are blinking more slowly and their eyeballs are rolling a little bit and I know you've all experienced it this is when things start to look double and blurry and then you kind of snap back this is when if you were not laying down your head would be drooping and you get the little anti-gravity jolt I'm awake again now you're all frightened I'm looking for somebody who's experiencing this um, but that's what's happening is you're still in alpha but you're occasionally experiencing theta waves this is the time period when your brain waves are starting to fire in synchrony. So you're getting synchronous firing. And, and that drowsiness is coming upon you. So that's like the first 10 minutes as you drift into sleep. Another 10, 15 minutes later, you're going to enter stage 2 sleep. And stage 2 sleep is characterized by two really interesting waves. Um, sleep spindles, which is really fast firing of the neurons in synchrony. And that happens fairly often in response to noises. So you're asleep, and there's some kind of stimulus, and you'll see those appear. And then K-complexes. The K-complex is believed to be a precursor to deeper wave sleep that we'll talk about in a second. But both of these waves are very important to memory. So very interesting studies where we look at people uh, learning something brand new, 
put them into sleep. <coughs> and we find that if you don't have a lot of these, you can't remember it as well the next day. So they're very tied to memory consolidation, fire together, wire together. We also see stage three and four, very t and REM, very tied to memory consolidation. Stage three and four I've got together because they're both characterized by these really large slow waves. So it's also called slow wave sleep. And they're called delta waves, where many of your neurons are firing in synchrony with one another. So this is when they're firing. This is when they're not firing in synchrony. And the only difference between three and four is the percent of time you're in delta. So we typically just call them slow wave sleep at this point. Um, and look how different they look then. And if you, if you wake somebody up here in stage two, they often tell you they weren't asleep. I wasn't asleep. If you wake somebody up in three and four, they're groggy, they're confused. So we also call it deep sleep because they're out of it. If you wake somebody up in REM sleep, I'm sure you know what happens, if you're familiar with REM sleep, they typically will report they're dreaming. They also seem very awake and alert. And look how different the waves are. We've gone back to asynchronous waves, and this is the time period you'll have very rapid eye movements, but you'll also, if you're a typical sleeper, be paralyzed. You might get an occasional muscle twitch, but your eyes are moving like crazy, because your eyes are basically just your brain. And if you woke them up, you would be in a dream state. So those are the, and, and through the night, you go through these stages over and over. So the first REM usually happens about an hour and a half into sleep, unless you're very sleep deprived, then you might want to have one earlier. And earlier in the night, you've got a lot more of your deep, slow wave sleep. And as the night progresses, you tend to alternate more between two and REM over and over with the REM episodes getting longer and longer, which is often why you wake up and you remember this really crazy dream that went on and it felt like it went on for hours. Um, because you're having more REM um, in that time right before you wake up. I saw some questions. Yeah. So where would sleepwalking fall into this? Well, sleepwalking and sleep talking are definitely not typical sleeping behaviors, but they're usually most likely the fact that you're not paralyzed when you should be paralyzed. So, so people who sleepwalk and talk are enacting uh, uh, stages. I've seen some people argue that it's a little bit in four, but it's also in REM. The, the theories really have to do with the fact that you should be paralyzed and you're not. And so you'll act out things that are occurring in your dreams. <laughs> yes? Um, how does, is sleep paralysis just when you, like the stage where you uh, can't move? Ah, uh, yes. So sleep paralysis is sort of almost the opposite of sleepwalking and talking. How many of you have ever had a time where you felt like you were awake, but you were actually paralyzed. And often there are really bizarro hallucinations that are happening around it. You might hear things or see things, and you're screaming at your body to move. It's called sleep paralysis. It can happen at sleep onset, and it can happen at sleep offset. The most common time it happens is actually when you're sleeping at times of the day that you really shouldn't be sleeping. Like you sleep in extra long, and what's happening is, again, your, your stages are getting mixed up. So you're experiencing the hallucinatory dreamlike stuff of REM while you're actually in a wrong stage, or, or you've got the paralysis of REM, but you really should be awake. And so part of you is awake and part of you is still paralyzed. You really are not moving very well. Um, they happen, they can be very benign. They can go along with other sleep disorders, but there's lots of people who have them. It's actually one of the um, uh, philosophical explanations for alien abduction that people talk about because, because they describe it as weird hallucinatory activity and they're paralyzed and stuff happens to you. So yeah. What about that feeling of falling you get when you're like falling asleep? Oh yeah, well that's your anti-gravity muscles kicking in. So if you're sitting up and you're falling asleep, they do a really good job, right? It's like, wah, you know, you're not gonna tip over. But so for some people as they're falling asleep, they will get that sensation, I am actually falling out of bed and, and you jolt yourself back awake. So yeah, <laughs> double questions, yeah. Um, I was just gonna ask explain the difference between a nightmare and then like a, like a sleep terror sort of Oh yeah, sleep terrors um, are different. Um, and, if I, and, and again, I'm not a sleep clinician. I do sleep research on cognition, but I also have a kid who had sleep terrors. So sleep terrors, people aren't having dreams. They might have an image of something, but they are experiencing that total external presentation of what looks like fear 
often you wake them up, they're groggy, confused, and they have no idea what's going on, although they might say there was an image. Whereas a nightmare, that's, that's REM. Um, and one of the things we know about REM sleep, if you remember your dreams, is they usually have some pretty heavy emotional content, right? Because the limbic system is going crazy. And, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. What's firing? Or I could talk about it right now. So at this point in REM sleep, your brain is actually really super active. So in terms of oxygen consumption and glucose consumption, your brain is firing like crazy. Your body is completely relaxed, but your brain is super active, except in the frontal lobes. So your temporal occipital lobes are firing extra heavy, which is vision and audition. You're hearing and seeing things. Your limbic system, which if I could put my fingers through my brain and have them meet, it's about where your limbic system is, controls emotions. It's related to emotional experience. That's firing like crazy, so not surprisingly, you can get really heavy emotions attached to your dreams. But your frontal lobes are actually deactivated. They're less active during REM. And your frontal lobes are what's telling you that things make sense and that they're reasonable. So dreams can have these amazing plot lines and characters and people from your past can pop in and now they're riding in a canoe down East State Street. And I'm not saying that's been a dream of mine, but, um, <laughs> but it makes sense and, you, and nothing stops that from happening. The story just goes on and you wake up and you think, what the heck was that? But at the time, your brain just lets it happen because all that activity is firing and creating a whole story and the brain interprets it and there's no frontal lobes to say, wait, this doesn't really make sense. This isn't working. So yeah, question here. So like, um, one time I had a dream that was kind of scary, but I woke up from it and then I saw something that I knew couldn't be there, but I knew I was awake, so I, because I flipped over, because that was kind of scary. Like, how would you explain that? Is that like... Well, your like, brain just... Your brain, so that question has to do with still experiencing things, you know, wake up from a nightmare and, and part of it's still hanging out. Your brain was experiencing that as real at the time, right? So it takes a little while for the brain to, I mean, that's reality to your brain. Whatever's firing is reality at the time. Even though there's not outside perceptions of the monster who was chasing you, your brain was experiencing it as real. Yeah, I saw it. So, yeah. And sometimes it can be based on things in the room. So in, oops, I flipped it. In REM sleep, you're not typically awakened by uh, non-meaningful sounds. They'll get just incorporated into your dream. So if you heard something, you know, if there's a dog barking outside, suddenly there's a dog in your dream, and you're not aware of it. Again, we don't remember most of our dreams because we go on into our other sleep stages and there's no reason to remember them. But if someone said your name when you were in REM, you likely would wake up and you would be, you'd be very alert and attentive. Or fire alarms, they're meaningful, so you would wake up and you would seem very alert and attentive, unlike here where you're super groggy and hard to wake up. Um, I want to get to some of the cognition stuff, so I'm going to hold any more questions about sleep waves, although clearly there's a lot of them, just so we can get to some of the cognitive stuff. And also because I want you all to fix your sleep, so I want to get to the, the good stuff. But then I can flip back. All right, why is sleep related to cognition? So why would our sleep affect our cognition? We actually have some really good reasons for that. One explanation is inflammatory processes. We know, as I said before, sleep is absolutely essential to functioning. It's very important to immune functioning. People who are sleep deprived have increased inflammatory processes and poor immune system throughout their whole body. So it adds to risk for diabetes, it adds to risk for cardiovascular diseases, it adds to risk for cancers. And those, many of those disorders in and of themselves also affect the brain. So it's indirectly affecting your cognition because it's, it's increasing your likelihood of having diseases that then affect your brain. But we also know that inflammatory processes affect the brain directly. And so there's a direct effect of too much inflammation, not good for your brain, it affects cognition. Another one, and actually this is very hot new science as of I think October 3rd, they finally actually showed something that back when I was taught neuroscience, they said simply wasn't true about the human brain, and that's that the brain does have lymphatic vessels. We knew that the brain, the cerebral spinal fluid, must do something with brain waste, must help remove brain waste, including the kinds of uh, cell degradations that are related to Alzheimer's disease. And we knew from a lot of rat research and a little bit of human research that your cerebral spinal fluid is much more active during slow wave sleep and REM sleep, the restorative sleep. So it should be washing out 
more brain waste. And we now know that that's draining out lymphatic vessels in the brain that they just now discovered and proved really exist. So one of the big theories, why could this be related to cognition, especially as we age, is that without good restorative sleep, your brain can't wash out your brain waste. And I know some of you who are really young are thinking, yeah, that doesn't matter. Alzheimer's and dementia are the ultimate neurodevelopmental disorders because the risk factors for them are throughout your, your adult life and really in your adolescence life to adult. The, the things you are doing, your brain's not done yet when you're adolescence and a young adult. And the very brain areas that aren't done yet are the ones most vulnerable to Alzheimer's. So it's the ultimate neurodevelopmental disorder. Your sleep now could very much be related to your risk factors later for those kinds of disorders. We also, as I pointed out, there's brain activity changes during sleep, but even when you're sleep deprived, if we measured your brain functioning during the day, just generally at rest, we would see your brain isn't working very well. You have a lot less activity going on when you're sleep deprived. Again, the most common regions are that prefrontal cortex and then the, another integration area, the posterior parietal lobe, and the cortical thalamic network. Most of you have heard of the thalamus if you've ever taken anything about the brain, and you know, you know that it's the relay station of the brain because that's what all the Psych 101 textbooks say. Well, that is what it is. The, the thalamus is what relays information, spinal cord, brain stem, up to your cortex and back, and there's less activity there if you're sleep, sleep deprived. So you're just, you don't have as efficient of a relay going on, getting information back and forth. And again, as I already mentioned, we know REM sleep, slow wave sleep, and sleep spindles, absolutely crucial for forming new memories with some very cool experimental designs of teaching people things and then measuring not only their brain waves, but also where in the brain is their activity. Your brain is clearly firing together, refiring that information. If I taught you a really cool motor sequence and then let you sleep and you got good sleep, you would be repeating that motor sequence in your brain over and over again during the night and you would do it better in the morning. If I deprived you of sleep and you didn't get to experience these, you would not have learned that information as well. And that's true for motor memory, it's true for learning new information, making associations, memorizing things for your tests. You have to get some sleep to consolidate those memories. Sorry, I used my mom voice. But sleep is so important. There are other ways, though, that sleep affects cognition. And these are ones that people are not as aware of or that they don't think about. And that is, you might be asleep. So, microsleeps and semi-dreaming. You're sleeping when you're not aware you're sleeping. As I mentioned before, you can be in stage one and stage two sleep and something wakes you up and you'll be very convinced you were not asleep. Even though our little EEGs are telling you, oh no, you were asleep, you were, you were actually all the way in stage two sleep, no way. I just wasn't paying attention. No, you're actually unconscious, which means you're not registering information. You can't pay attention to it because you're literally not registering that information at that time. Semi-dreaming is like a longer version of that. And this is you know, an example off the internet of semi, you, you all have your own examples, I'm sure, in anything you've ever taken notes on where you, you're convinced you're taking notes and then later you look at them and you're like, what is that? <laughs> what on earth was I? That's writing, but you, you, at the time, you're sure that you were writing things down. So these are very problematic, especially for driving. So there's a lot of public service announcements now showing we need to be aware when you're doing something long distance that you're not necessarily aware that you're not conscious part of the time. Driving while sleep deprived is, is horribly dangerous. Very quick words on can, what can you do about it then? Can naps help? Well, there is some research, some really cool experiments where they bring people in, have them nap in the lab. It sounds like so much fun to me. I'm, I'm actually thinking I should do this study. And then remeasure their cognitive abilities, see if a nap is restorative. It can be a little restorative, but it doesn't correct your whole sleep debt, and it doesn't help with reaction time at all. It can help correct your vigilance and your attention, at least in the short term. The problem with napping, to go back to your question, is if you do it on a regular basis to make up for poor sleep in the night, you're never going to sleep well in the night because you're fragmenting. You're wasting your sleep debt during the day, which gets rid of some sleep need, but not efficiently, and then you can't sleep later in the night. So if you're laying in front of the television for three hours, okay, well, that was some sleep, but you're not gonna be able to get sleep very well when you go in your bed. Caffeine and other stimulants, 
Um, yes, they can inhibit the effects of fatigue. Again, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to really explain why. They certainly have side effects. So, you know, I think this is coffee number five for me today, which is a really super bad idea. I know, mouth, this is, yeah, this is the semester of caffeine for me. And indeed, heart palpitations, definitely aware of that. Probably not great for my blood pressure. And that's true of, of various stimulant medications as well. If we use them too close to sleep, then we get poor sleep because we're aroused, we're awake, we can't function. I, I, some of you know me and, and I'm this fast even off of caffeine. So this is just really kind of making me happier. Um, uh, we really don't know doses and it turns out they are, we can develop a dependence on stimulants as well as caffeine as well as others. And research shows they make you overconfident that you won't make errors. So when we do experiments and give sleep deprived people a cup of coffee and say do this task, they're very confident that they won't make errors and they still do. Not as many as they would off the coffee. It turns out though also a fair amount of the effect is placebo. You all heard of placebo effect? It's really not the active neurochemical ingredients in it, but it's because we think it will help that it helps. Now I figure if you're about to go to class and you really need to stay awake, you know, even if it's placebo, okay, put it in there so we don't have to watch you fall asleep. But, um, but it turns out it's not entirely the substances that are helping you. We just think it will. So I've talked about these implications, um, except this we will come back to the question that somebody had about endurance. Um, none of us are designed to do cognitive tasks for too long in a row without starting to make errors and getting fatigued. So, you know, the eight hour work, work day makes sense because we will become dysfunctional. <laughs> Our circadian rhythms are starting to move to relaxation. We're going to make errors. The longer you work past that, the more errors you're going to make. We simply aren't made to work that long. But if you're sleep deprived, you're never even going to make it that far. You're going to be even more impaired. There's no question that sleep has huge effects in terms of health care, productivity at work, economic costs to our society, and accidents. Driving simulator studies show it can be worse than operating while intoxicated to be operating a vehicle while sleep deprived in terms of accidents. Um, I've commented on most of these special things for the college students, so I'm not going to talk about them more. I talked about shifting sleep. Um, we did a really cool study a few years ago um, with students who believe they have ADHD. Again, we brought them in, put them in a lab. They were sleep mostly sleep deprived. They, we made them do vigilance tasks. We made them watch a really boring video of me talking about eye diseases and take notes. We had them hooked up and we stepped out of the room and watched them fall asleep. But when we saw them entering sleep stages, we then checked in with the microphone and said, are you asleep? And they'd say no. But we watched them microsleep through their event and what they said was, well, that was hard to pay attention to. So I was inattentive. Like, well, no, actually you were asleep. You were having microsleeps over and over again. So when you're sleep deprived, that may explain your poor attention. The really bad thing for college students because of where you live is you can't follow good uh, sleep hygiene. You can't follow, a, uh, your bed is your only piece of furniture in your residence hall. That's where you're going to study, that's where you're going to read, that's where you're going to text people, that's where you're going to watch social media and watch Netflix. It, 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 you can't keep bed for sleep only if that's your only piece of furniture. So it's really hard to follow good sleep hygiene as a college student, unfortunately. For older adults, again, I'll talk about this briefly because I know that, that we have some folks who might be interested in that. Poor sleep quality and presence of sleep disorders is predictive of dementia. It turns out that dementia also predicts um, poor sleep. So it's a, it's a sort of a vicious circle. But if we have poor sleep and we have chronically poor sleep, it raises our risk for dementia for reasons I already mentioned. But the dementia process itself creates fragmented sleep, makes it really hard to sleep. So it's, it's definitely associated to our health later um, and our cognitive health later. So what the heck can you do? This is really small and it's really not sexy. In other words, I can't fix it for you. Don't we wish that we could just fix our sleep? Sleep is a habit and so that means you have to develop the habit. So during the day you need to do things that signal that I'm awake. Expose yourself to the sunlight, Limit your naps during the day. If you exercise, do it during the day, not right before you go to bed, because that's when you should be awake, alert, aroused, have your body temperature up, etc. Do the things that should be awake during your waking hours. 
As you move towards sleep, then avoid your stimulants. Big mistake for me right now. Don't be exercising late. Avoid foods that trigger heartburn. Don't drink too much of any liquid, but especially not alcohol, so that you don't have to get up and go to the bathroom all night. Have a relaxing bedtime routine. Make sure your room is comfortable. Bed is for sleep and the other sex word. That's what sleep clinicians will say. Sleep and sex, that's it, nothing else. Do not read, don't use your phone, don't do anything else. Don't, that's what your bed is for because you'll condition it better. If you can't fall asleep, get out of bed. Most people really believe, okay, but I'm resting. No, you're not. The restorative part of sleep is the act of sleeping. That's what helps you cognitively. It doesn't matter that you're laying flat. Go in another room and just don't move around until you get sleepy again and then get back in your bed. That's really tough to do. That's a hard piece of the habit to break. And so it usually requires people to help, to get a sleep clinician to help them, to talk them through. Couple last words, because I know we're running out of time. Be very careful about long-term use of sleep agents. According to all medical advice, that's contraindicated. It actually makes sleep worse. And don't use alcohol to fall asleep. It will help you fall asleep. It will wake you up in the middle of the night and you will not get back to sleep. And not just because you have to go to the bathroom, but the effect it actually has on your brain is that it will wake you up in the middle of the night and it will keep you up um, because of how it affects the sleep waves. So don't use alcohol to fall asleep. Bad idea. So again, it's not, I can't fix your sleep, but getting good sleep will help your cognition in the short term as well as in the long term. And I bet you anything I'm out of time. So, but I'm happy to stick around and answer other questions. in the back. Yes, there are actually people who tend toward being night owls and people who tend toward being um, early morning risers. Um, the, the, the shift phases that I talked about before tend to be why more young people are night owls and older people tend to be early risers because most people are like that. Yes, there are some people who just pretty much know if that's your natural pattern. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I, oh boy, I started a problem. 